We are here for another ALICE interview with Professor Gurminder Bambara from the University of uh, Warwick, but visiting professor in several universities in Europe and elsewhere, including uh, Princeton, uh, Linus, and Brasilia. And this year she is the um, chair of Ventura de Sousa Santos at the Faculty of Economics of the University of Coimbra. So, Thank you for being here with us. My pleasure. And uh, welcome to Coimbra. Thank you. And to the Alice Project. Um, you have written a number of books, um, both alone and in uh, editing books with others. Um, probably those that uh, remained more uh, interesting for, in the perspective of uh, Alice, are your own books, uh, namely Rethinking Modernity post-colonialism and sociological imagination, uh, edited by, um, published by Palgrave in 2007, and uh, Connected Sociologies uh, by Bloomsbury Academic. Um, in these books, um, you develop a lot of uh, uh, sociological uh, and philosophical concepts, and you go very deep into this concept, which is um, uh, very critical stance uh, that you have in common with the Alice project or that the Alice project has in common with you and um, I would like around this um, uh, topic to build our conversation but before that I would like you to introduce yourself and your academic path how you came to this uh, rich sociological uh, theorization well I mean my background is in history really and um, when I started the PhD at Sussex in social and political thought I started on a completely different topic than I ended up writing about and what I had wanted to study was social movements so another connection with the Alice project there and I was interested in the way in which social movements had existed across time and in different places and that even though people talked about pre-modern movements modern movements and postmodern movements Having looked at some movements from those different periods, they look to actually structurally be quite similar instead of different. And then instead of going on to sort of do more research on the movements, I sort of thought, well, perhaps it would be a good idea to try and figure out what it means to be modern first. Because if all the sociological literature is referring to these movements in terms of their relationship to modernity, then I should really know what modernity is. That ended up as the first book instead of what I had been working on, in part because what I came across very quickly was that within the sociological literature, even if people were Marxists or they were barbarians or they were postmodernists or whatever sort of position they had in those terms, that they all agreed on two things about the idea of modernity. So they maybe had completely different ideas on every other aspect, but there were two things that everybody agreed on. One was that the modern world, or that modernity signified a rupture between a pre-modern agrarian past and a modern industrial present, and that this rupture in time was located spatially within Europe, which marked Europe out as distinct from the rest of the world. And they were absolutely convinced on this notion of a temporal rupture and a spatial rupture. But having a historical background, and having studied history quite extensively, I was aware that historians were not that sympathetic to these ideas of ruptures, or at least there was enough solid, rigorous historical research that counteracted the narratives of rupture with narratives of connection instead. And so I began to think, well, if the historical research that's going on in the present has superseded this idea of rupture and is actually talking much more about connections, but in sociology, we continue to use histories that are much older and based on these notions of rupture, because that's, in a sense, how the discipline got founded on, on an earlier understanding of history. How would sociology look differently if we use this idea of connected history, say, as the basis of understanding things sociologically, rather than the idea of rupture? So in a sense, in the first book, what I did was take the three key moments of rupture as traditionally presented within the literature, that's the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, and then in a sense preceding that, the Renaissance and Reformation. And I sought to demonstrate how 
while standard histories might present them in terms of their uniqueness, their endogeneity and, and their ruptural aspects, there was significant historical research that actually pointed to broader connections such that the standard arguments could be transformed in light of this new historical research. And then the point wasn't simply that the histories could be told differently, but what difference would that make for sociology to understand itself differently? Apparently, um, your uh, critical point of view uh, towards history uh, mm -hmm. is linked with the connection of history and Europe, the development that history took in Europe and the fact that this development was globalized mm -hmm. and uh, assumed as valid for all over the world, while uh, you strongly criticize the fact that uh, this kind of uh, historical uh, thinking has silenced uh, histories elsewhere, elsewhere. Could you please explain us more about this? So if I give you one example, so when I take um issue with, say, the history of the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the standard histories of the Industrial Revolution presented as something that happens within Europe, or if you want to be more specific, within Western Europe, or the ones that want to be really specific talk about it as emerging in the cotton mills of Manchester and Lancaster, and that the developments that occurred there then spread around the rest of the world. But if you just take that phrase, the cotton mills of Manchester and Lancaster, Cotton isn't a plant that's native to England, let alone to Europe. It comes from India, as does the technology of how to dye and weave it. It was grown in the southern states of the US and the West Indies by Africans who were transported there as part of the European trade in human beings. And the raw material was brought back to these factories to be turned into cloth. So in a sense, you can't have the cotton mills of Manchester and Lancaster without there already being a global connected history that enables, and well global connected processes really, that enable that cotton to arrive at Manchester to be turned into cloth. And then for that cloth to be sold on the world market, that cloth, at least at the beginning, was of inferior quality, it wasn't deemed to be as good as cloth made elsewhere, and it didn't sell. So one of the ways in which it was sold was by destroying the cotton industry in other places. So this market that we talk about as free and industrial revolution simply spreading around the world, it doesn't simply spread. It's a process that's quite violent, that's coercive, both in the production of cotton, but then also in the sale of cotton around the world. So in these ways, I think the histories that we regard as our common sense histories, our common sense understanding of how the world has come to be, are deeply problematic for their parochiality, their failure to acknowledge the global conditions that enable them, that enable the processes that they talked about to actually occur. I see that there is a strong connection uh, between uh, this vision of history and, and globalization. And the fact that uh, also what we call cosmopolitanism mm -hmm. could, could be very different than what we think it is. And uh, the, the thinking about cosmopolitanism in Europe remains connected with this centrality of uh, Eurocentrism in history, uh, what do you think it should be instead? Well, the difficulty with cosmopolitanism in the present, I think, is partly, again, the genealogy that it traces. So most work on trying to understand the European, or European cosmopolitanism traces its origins back to the Stoics and Kant and then the modern nation and, and so on. And that's that sort of presents a particular history which even if we took it in its own terms it's a history when Europe was deeply connected to much of the rest of the world and its cosmopolitan ethic is one that's intimately tied to the violence that's also being done under its own name in, in other places and it's only when that violence comes home to Europe that in a sense there's a questioning of what the cosmopolitanism may actually mean and, and, and so on. So I think again there are different sort of responses to this question. One is to sort of think about the ways in which our understandings of cosmopolitanism tend to be limited to a particular European genealogy. That genealogy isn't sufficient in its own terms because it doesn't take into account the less than cosmopolitan practices with which the emergence of the idea is connected. 
but it also doesn't take into account the fact that people around the world have sought to think about how to live with others across differences. So if we think that at its most banal form, cosmopolitanism refers to something like, how can we live with others who are different to us? Whatever that difference may be. I find it remarkable that people think that only Europeans have ever grappled with that question. So if we want to understand what cosmopolitanism is, I think we need to be, and, and this was the words of Pollock and others, we need to be archivally cosmopolitan, i.e. look beyond Europe, look beyond European history, to look at how other societies in different places and different times have sought to learn to live across those differences and work out what it is that we can learn from those other practices. There are other Indian scholars like uh, Chakrabarti who speaks about uh, provincializing Europe mm -hmm. seems a response to, to this uh, issue that you also raise with others. Uh, but uh, I know you have a different uh, point of view on that. Provincializing Europe wouldn't suffice, suffice to, to solve the, the status quo of this uh, situation. So what would you suggest? I mean, I think provincializing Europe is part of the, the, the response and it's a necessary part of the response but I think there's a need that what I argue for in particular is the need to transform our sociological understandings beyond this so it's not to argue a that Europe did this and nowhere else did it or uh, or that when when the argument is made that Europe did this one response is oh but this also happened in other places and another response is oh but it wasn't great what happened in Europe and so on but to, for me, those responses present Europe and the rest as continually separated. And in part, I want to provincialise Europe by actually locating it within the connections that constitute the globe. That there's nothing about Europe that's unique or special or distinctive in, um, if you like, intellectual terms. There are distinctive aspects of European history and the aspects of that history needs to be taken into account. But for me, what's the distinctive aspects of European history are the European trade in other human beings, European colonisation, imperialism, and, and these sorts of processes. And yet when we talk about European uniqueness, these aren't the things that we ever talk about. So I'm happy to accept that there are some things that make Europe unique, but they're not the things that generally we talk about. And so for me, the issue is what happens to our understandings of Europe and the world once we locate Europe as the instigator and perpetuator of these sorts of processes and begin to understand the world as a world that's been constructed as a consequence of colonization, enslavement, dispossession, appropriation and genocide. That would force us to look at the place of Europe differently in relation to thinking about what solutions might be needed for problems that we continue to share. I see that there is an evidence in what you're saying and the evidence is the connection between uh, colonialism and capitalism, mm -hmm. which is a product of Europe. It may be possible that uh, the same could have been developed by other culture uh, with probably different density. But uh, we see the, the, the force of history in this fact, the, the fact that uh, colonialism interconnected with capitalism developed the globalization, let's say, as an mm -hmm. ultimate result uh, of uh, Eurocentrism, if we want, as it is, is something that also the epistemologists of the South tackle, uh, also to um, rediscover um, alternatives and complementarities with, uh, with other culture, other soci societies. Um, I know that you um, developed this concept of um, connected sociology uh, in contrast with comparative sociologies as having uh, European sociologies as a point of reference. So I would like to know more about that, please. I mean, in relation to capitalism, first, I think I want to sort of state that in a sense, again, the standard histories talk about capitalism and colonialism as something that occurs subsequent to it. So most uh, historical accounts present it in that way. And I think that actually capitalism wouldn't have been able to emerge without colonization. So without the silver from the Potosi mines in Mexico, without the 
labour of enslaved Africans in the plantations and so on without the appropriation of resources from much of the rest of the world and the destruction of markets in China through the Opium Wars and other places and so on. So in a sense, colonisation is the precondition to the emergence of capitalist practices. And neither Marxist sort of schools of, of capitalism, whether it's the Brenner Wood thesis about the transformation of the social relations of production, or whether it's a sort of Wallersteinian perspective around the expansion of markets, none of them really get to the aspect that the processes they're talking about are embedded within broader processes which provide the conditions for what it is that they're discussing. There's no way you can have markets simply expanding through their own logic. They don't expand through their own logic, they expand through a colonial logic of, you know. Um, and, and so in that sense, I think again, that whilst I think there is a connection to be made between thinking about colonial, colonialism and capitalism, we often have the relationship the wrong way around. For example, the plantations were Fordist, if you want to use it, before the Fordist factories. And so what is it that doesn't enable us to recognise the emergence of capitalism out of colonisation? What's the block there that stops people looking at that? So then to sort of talk about connected sociologies, I think partly that the push to this is really that what comparative sociology seems to do is often set up that there's something that's A and there's something that's B. Let's understand A in terms of the characteristics that make A, A. And let's understand B in terms of its internal characteristics that make it B. And then we can compare them. But it's very unlikely that we would find anything that's self-contained in that way, be it nations, be it civilizations, be it societies, be it whatever, where what makes A A isn't also conditional on everything that is outside of that. So I think the comparative approach is problematic because it abstracts strongly out of connections where if you located it back within those broader connections those connections would enable us to make more sense of what a is than simply trying to understand it internally i mean to give you one example and perhaps a very sort of current example in light of brexit and, and so on is that when people have sought to understand i mean ever since the 1970s tom nairn for example wrote a book the breakup of britain and there's been a lot of research on what's happening to Britain, why does Scotland want independence, why is Britain breaking up and so on. And a lot of the explanations that have been given have been internal to Britain, trying to understand the breakup of Britain from within Britain. But if you think about Britain, there was no Britain outside of the British Empire. The only thing that makes Britain Britain was empire. So after decolonisation, it's no surprise that Britain itself is breaking up because the thing that gave it coherence no longer exists. So we can't understand anything of what's happening in Britain, even today, and I would say probably particularly today in the context of Brexit, without locating it in the histories of empire within which itself was embedded for the last 300 years. Now, before coming back to the evidence mm -hmm. of a methodological issue in sociology, uh, besides theoretical issue, I would like you to tackle the the issue of refugees, uh, which is connected uh, with with the Brexit, but uh, is not the, the only reason, as we know. And uh, how do you think that the cosmopolitan ideal that Europe thinks to have is being challenged by this uh, by this new uh, crisis of of refugees in Europe? I mean, I would, I like. I would prefer to say the crisis for refugees because the crisis really isn't for Europe. I mean, at the last count, the number of people who'd made refugee applications in, in Europe constituted 0.26% of the entire population of Europe. So I find it quite extraordinary the extent to which there's this sort of consternation within Europe as to what is it that we're going to do? We're faced with this massive crisis, all these people wishing to come here, how are we going to cope? When, at a very basic level, part of what constitutes cosmopolitan Europe. Well, cosmopolitan Europe is also constituted by the fact that the European countries individually and as a whole through the EU have signed up to the European Declaration of Human Rights, have signed up to the UN Declaration of Human Rights, within which the right to seek refuge 
which has to have a correlate, the right to uh, grant refuge to people who are fleeing war, persecution, destruction, famine, is written into the international treaties that we've signed up to. So in a sense, at a very prosaic level, our cosmopolitanism is constituted by our commitment to international treaties and international law. And if we were to give that up, what right would we have to consider ourselves as cosmopolitan or indeed enlightened? And so I think the refugee, that the crisis for refugees is certainly throwing a sharp light on Europe's own understanding of itself. And if it wishes not to see itself in a bad light, it needs to act much better in relation to this. And I would say, you know, that Germany and Sweden have been exemplars in the way in which they have responded, and I think that that's been incredibly positive. But the way in which countries like Britain, France, and other places have responded has been absolutely abysmal, and that really needs to be addressed. Thank you for these three chances. Uh, coming back to the issue of methodology, mm -hmm. um, in, in the Alice project, we developed this idea of um, academic activist, uh, so uh, sociologists who are engaged with the movement that they study mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fact that uh, they don't study the movement, they study with the movement. Um, and they try to emphasize the practices, alternative or complementary, what Boaventura de Sousa Santos calls the uh, sociology of emergencies. Um, I think you have touched on this, and I would like to know more, uh, but you have also worked on the, the, the sociology of absences, uh, which is amplifying the fact that uh, so much silencing has emerged. So could you elaborate a bit on that? I think in part the way in which I sort of frame it is really to think about the ways in which the histories that we use to justify the social scientific concepts we make use of have been selective histories and everything is always going to be selective so I'm not sort of trying to make an argument that we should cover everything because we never can cover everything but the selections we make have to be adequate to the terms under discussion and if they're not adequate then we should rethink them so in that sense, and perhaps um, I can give another example to sort of make clearer what it is that I'm saying, that when we think about citizenship in Europe, and again I use the example of Britain, if we think about British citizenship, we usually associate citizenship in the present with belonging historically to the nation. And so who has rights or who has the right to have rights in the present is associated with whether they can demonstrate they're belonging to the nation historically. But Britain's never been a nation. It's always been an empire. So if our political rights in the present are associated with a history that's national, but the polity has never been national but only ever imperial, then we're doing an injustice in the present by linking citizenship rights to national histories when they should actually be linked to imperial histories. And in fact, British citizenship in its very first articulation was a citizenship that conferred, you know, the title was you were a citizen of the UK and its colonies. There was no distinction between you were a citizen of the UK and a separate citizenship for, for the colonies. No, it was one co-joined citizenship. That's not part of current debate. It's not part of people's political imaginations when they think about, oh, why are they coming here taking our benefits? What have they ever contributed? Well, actually, they, to the extent that they come from former empire, contributed through their resources, their taxations, their wealth, their whatever, which was it came into the national government for use that it could sort of uh, use that money any way in which it wished. So... For me, it's about thinking about whether the histories we use to support our concepts are adequate to their utilisation. And I would suggest that using a national history in light of the fact that Britain was an empire is inadequate. And so we need to have an adequate history. And that adequate history would require us then to reconstruct our understandings of the political present. 
and politics in the present. This is great. I would like to explore this concept of intercultural translations mm -hmm. that uh, is part of the epistemologies of the South and that you also encompass in your, um, uh, in your um, connected sociology. Uh, how do you think that different sociological approach can dialogue, uh, starting from the point of view of uh, academia, meaning the highest ranking universities in the world are located in Europe and uh, in the US mainly, uh, and few other countries, and uh, it seems impossible for uh, emerging sociologists, let's say, compared to the uh, mainstream one, to, to be able to be recognized as the other, as the same dignity. So. Well, I think one thing that we have to recognize is that the world that we currently live in has been configured by a history that's at least 500 years in its making. And decolonization is a process that has a history of maybe 60 years. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, that we're not going to get decolonial knowledge without a decolonial world. And given that we've barely scratched the surface of the work that's needed to address issues of social justice in the present, which, I mean, every issue of inequality in the present will have a historical precedent, will have historical processes that have brought about those current configurations. And so in a sense, one of the ways in which to address those past injustices is to look at the way in which those injustices continue to have ramifications in the present and think about what needs to be done to address that. On the issue of sort of um, thinking about intercultural communication, I think it's an incredibly important task and, and it needs to be done and there are lots of people who are engaged in doing that work. Where my own focus is, is to think about destabilizing the claims that are made within the Western metropole about how this knowledge is Western. Not by then saying, oh, there's another knowledge that's equivalent to this knowledge, but to try and demonstrate how the very concepts and categories that we use were themselves constructed out of encounters and engagements. So I'm not prepared to give over Western knowledge to the West because I don't believe it has the right to claim that, given that a lot of these ideas and thought processes and so on came about as a consequence of encounters, very unequal encounters, but nonetheless they were encounters and conversations and dialogues and processes and so on. And so in that sense, for me, there's always this issue of working with what exists to demonstrate its own inadequacies in its own terms, let alone then contrasting that with the knowledges that come from other places and thinking about it you know that that's I think of these two projects in a sense as complementary projects where both are needed but my work has been much more focused on seeking to dismantle your what are claimed as European concepts from the inside and demonstrating how in a sense the concepts have always been configured in relation to global histories and that that history has been masked and claimed as you and and the concepts claimed as universal, even though the histories they relate to, in uh, public terms, if you like, have been parochial histories. So there's this odd situation where you have European science presented as universal, but only ever referring to the good histories of Europe. And I wish to sort of argue that these are universal to the extent that they're embedded within global histories. But recognizing the global histories gives us the access of transforming those concepts where we deem them to be inadequate for our use in the present. Thank you for your enriching answer. So let's come to the very last question. Um, the main question of the Alice project uh, probably is what can Europe learn from the world? I would like you to address this question, although of course you have been answering to this all over your our conversation. Something more. I mean, I think in part it's to understand how its own history is embedded in the histories of those places that it deems other. So there is no European history that isn't already a global history, given the extent of European conquest and invasion around 
most of the world's territories. I was reading something the other day that apparently only four or five countries in the world have never been colonized by, by a European country. And so when you have that extent of, of, of conquest, how can that not have an impact in the configuration of the present? So we talked about refugees earlier, but one of the other things that often gets talked about is migrants. And yet, you know, and there's a distinction made between refugees and migrants, which I don't think is helpful, but it's made. But the issue is that the majority of people who are deemed to be migrants are not migrants. They're simply former subjects of empire. And given that, you know, if, if you're traveling within a country, say from York to London, you're not straightforwardly understood as a migrant. So why, if you were traveling from Delhi or Nairobi to, to London, would you be seen as a migrant? given that the polity within which you were within which you were traveling was the same polity but there's a tendency now to forget that history and now understand those who come as somehow that it's inappropriate that they do so despite the fact that for the last 500 years Europeans traveled the world and went wherever they wished and actually set up institutions and states and other places where where without the agreement of the populations over whom they were establishing these territories. So in a sense, I think what Europe really needs to learn is its own history in terms of that history of conquest, and then to reflect upon that history, to think about what would be needed in the present to make good on the injuries of the past. And in part, what would be needed is reparations. And that, I think, is the key question that Europe has to grapple with. Professor Bamra, thank you very much you. for this interview. It has been a great pleasure talking to you today. Thank you.